Hey guys, it's me. I'm here with Billy Hookman of Answers Pet Food. And we are going to be talking all about fermented foods. And one of the things that I noticed, Billy, is that whenever I'm in my group and someone brings up their dog's um, food intolerances, and everyone always recommends answers. And I wanted to talk to you about why is that? Why is it that if my dog can't eat beef or chicken or turkey, he does okay on answers recipes? Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's a few reasons. Uh, and the first reason is, um, before I sort of get into the fermentation part in, the, in, the, in terms of that, I think some of it has to do with just misdiagnosed allergy symptoms that could be related to something else. And I think even if that's the case, if you're dealing with, uh, my dog throws up every time it has beef, and then someone says move to answers pet food and, and you're talking about inoculating that pet with you know hundreds of types of good bacteria every day sometimes you can just have a change in that way which you know the end goal of this is the dog can eat food again right that's that's who cares how it happens it's just that's that that's the end goal it's sort of related to like the placebo effect when people are like oh that's just a placebo effect yeah but is the dog better because yeah. <laughs> that's all that matters um so um, I think that that can happen, but this whole story started with uh, my dog, Lua, cannot eat, uh, is allergic to eggs. And this is a huge bummer for me because one, we use eggs in our food because eggs are the second most complete food on the planet. And I just love the idea of feeding eggs just generally, right? Just adding eggs, doing that sort of stuff. So I said to myself, okay, well, uh, my base theory was, okay, if, if I ferment these eggs, what will happen if they are pre-digested? Will that pre-digestion change the um, structure of the protein enough to where her body recognizes the same? And the cool thing is it worked. Um, and so what I did with that was I took our fermented fish stock, I left it out for uh, 12 hours at room temperature, and then I put the egg in and then I leave it for another 12 to 24 hours at room temperature. Um, and then you get enough pre-digestion and it smells great, of course, but you get enough pre-digestion um, to actually do that. So we took that sort of premise and then we sort of, you know, because we, one of the things that makes us very unique is that we're working with dogs with health issues all around the country, um, you know, on a, on, a, on a very regular basis. And so one of the things we can do is, you know, gather data in that way. And so um, we said, okay, we know that this is going to work. Now let's start putting it out in the field. And, and eggs is the number one thing that we get. They say, I want to use your food, but my dog's allergic to eggs. Mm -hmm. And so um, then we go into the fermentation part. And I always just say, try it. At least try it. Um, and more often than not, we get back the results that the animal can actually eat it. Now, that's not to say that works every time, but it does work, I would say, more than 50% of the time in terms of doing that. And so... Going back to intolerances, that is um, a big misconception that we have is there are allergies, but then there are toler intolerances. So can you go over the difference between the two? Well, yeah, I mean, being allergic to, a, well, you know, I get people all the time who say, you know, who will call me and their dog will have some sort of chronic issue and they'll say, oh, I can't feed chicken. Well, why? My dog's allergic to chicken. Well, what does that mean? Well, every, I gave my dog chicken and my dog had diarrhea, right? That doesn't mean necessarily that your dog is, is you know, allergic to an animal, uh, to a specific animal protein. So when you're talking about allergy, you're talking about, you know, an immune system issue. When you're talking about just an animal's general ability to digest food, there are so many factors that go into it. It doesn't just come down to a chicken diet. Does that chicken diet have enough fat? Does that chicken diet, because all nutrients work in chorus with, with each other, right? A good example of, of how nutrients work, actually in a book I was reading recently, um, it's a human nutrition book, but uh, the, the author talks about eating sugar versus raw sugar, mm -hmm. right? And someone might say, well, it's just sugar, so who cares what it is? But there is actually a difference because raw sugar comes with nutrients that it needs in order to digest, right? It comes with certain minerals, it comes with certain nutrients that are needed um, to digest that sugar. Now, when you process that sugar and take those away, it will take those nutrients from your body in order to digest them because it needs them. And so in a lot of cases, you're looking um, at the same, at the same uh, sort of premise. But I would actually say that, you know, usually it's a bacteria related. When a dog is intolerant to virtually anything, I would say that that's related to bacteria because 
that's how we've grown our business is by helping animals just like that. So, so um, going to the bacteria and your products, uh, I, as you probably know, I'm sure actually you do know, because I'm kind of a psycho about your food, but I have a freezer full of the um, kefir and I have the fermented fish stock and now I have the turkey stock. And I was wondering, what is the difference as far as, you know, what it's doing for our dogs between um, the turkey stock, the kefir, the goat's milk, and mm -hmm. the fermented fish stock? Well, they're all just different. So, I mean, obviously they all have a, like uh, very different nutrient profiles. Like the milks are similar um, in terms of overall nutrient content. But obviously, you know, I get a lot of questions in, in relation to the bone broths and people often ask like, is it the same benefits? And I'm like, no, because they're completely different. But, but again, that goes back to that whole AFCO thing of how, how do you, you know, there is no such thing as complete and balanced. And we're just trying to, uh, you know, provide enough foods that are nutrient dense to cover any, any nutrient deficiencies. But what you're getting there is different types of fermentation. Mm -hmm. So for instance, with our goat's milk, we're adding two buttermilk cultures to it, which we chose those cultures because they start to grow at 40 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so what that, what'll happen is we, sort of a not, we, we put them into honey, they start to have a party and reproduce and go crazy. And then we add them to the milk. Um, and then they start to work in those lactose sugars. And then the process stops because we freeze them, which is another really weird thing I hear on the internet when people say that all the bacteria dies when you freeze something. <laughs> That's not true. We know this because we test foods for bacteria after the frozen. Um, it's weird. It's a, it's a very weird, uh, I get that question a lot. So, um, so essentially we pick that because, because as that low temperature start period, it will continue to ferment in your refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So um, with the kefir, you get a different type because it's that ye uh, kefir grains are mm -hmm. a yeast, and you say it better than I do. Uh, <laughs> you say kefir. I, I just, I'm from Wisconsin, so I just go <laughs> kefir. Um, so with those kefir grains, it's, it's, a, it's a colony of yeast and bacteria, which are very similar to like kombucha or something like that. Um, so you get all that good yeast and all that good bacteria. And we're actually fermenting that at 80 degrees for uh, 24 to 36 hours. And so, and, and that, the cool thing about the product is it's all done on one farm. So it's all one herd of cows and then Samuel milks them, Samuel ferments it, gives it to Irvin, Irvin puts it in the garden, <laughs> good to go. And um, so actually that's our most fermented product. Um, I would say actually by virtue of how fermented it is, it probably has um, zero lactose in it. Yeah. Um, just cause the, you know, and then with our bone broths, uh, and I think it would be a good time to mention, we were the first people to do bone broth on the market, like, you know, five years ago in terms of, um, in terms of our fermented fish stock, which no one will copy us on because nobody <laughs> wants to make fish stock, uh, it, even at home, right? I make bone broth at home, but I'm not going to boil a fish head or carcass <laughs> for 24 hours in my, in my house. My wife would, uh, kick me out, I think. So, um. <laughs> So essentially what we're trying to do there is get that goodness of bone broth, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, I do think it's worth clearing up uh, what I would perceive as misinformation about bone broth. So I make bone broth at home to, and, and when I do it, let's say I use a, a pig foot and chicken back. So let's say just use chicken or just use turkey because I drink a lot of bone broth myself. Um, it has varying degrees of being gelatinous, right? Sometimes you make bone broth and it's very gelatinous. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you make it and it's slightly thinner. And sometimes, uh, I think there's a, uh, I think people think if it's not gelatinous that there's no gelatin in it, yeah. which is just totally untrue. So if your bone broth is thinner, it, what, it, what essentially means is that those amino acids that need to come together to form gelatin just haven't come together. Your body will do that same process. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you look at our fish stock, our fish stock is not very gelatinous. It's very thin. Yeah. You're still getting the same gelatin content. So I think that that's uh, kind of worth mentioning. Um, with, our, with our sardines, uh, Steve, um, the guy who makes both of our bone broths and is a, a brilliant guy, he, um, he ferments those sardines for three days with whey, which we get now from our cheese treats and sea salt. So they essentially just naturally break down within three days. So you're getting kind of a traditional, it's like a fish, it's actually a fish paste recipe mm -hmm. that we're using there, much like the, the bone broth, uh, the bone broth recipe we use is from a cookbook as well. Yeah. Um, and then uh, with our turkey stock 
and the addition of the beats, which I'm very proud of because I that was the beats were my idea. So that was like my baby, you know, going out into the world or whatever. But um, the the it's interesting because we haven't done the so we always wait to get um, so we do certain nutrient testing, right? It just depends on what we want to do. We're a small company. So it's not like, I think people think you can be like, well, it's just nutrient test everything for everything. And that would be, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, um, so like, for instance, we, you know, we've done the, the LAB test, the lab test on the, um, lactic acid bacteria and the fish stocks. So we know that there's 2 billion per ounce in that. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're still waiting to do the, the LAB test on the turkey stock. Now, it, it wouldn't matter to me if we did it or didn't do it because you can see the telltale signs, right? Yeah. If you leave it out, it'll be bulging before, the, before you open it. That's because of those bacteria breathing. It's slightly fizzy. Yeah. So that's another. So you, um, but um, by my estimation, the turkey stock is actually more fermented than the fish stock because there's more sugars in those beets that they're able to predigest. So there's just a better, because we're fermenting it the same way. We're fermenting it with um, the whey and the Celtic sea salt. Um, in terms of that and so I for me I use one every other day um, you know just because I'm trying to get as many different strands of bacteria into my dog as possible so okay good so yeah I'm not crazy to have so much you just I am so addicted to it and I just I just like having those labels it's funny whenever I post a picture of my freezer everyone can identify the answers products they just can't see exactly what it is but well, and we're the only ones in cartons, so, yeah. <laughs> and that includes our meat. Um, and I will say on a personal note, I drink the fish stock, so um, really? we are we are crazy people, definitely. I think I'll, maybe I'll give it a try then. My, well, my, my advice to you, because I can legally tell you to do this, because they're, it's not like raw milk where I go to jail if I tell you to drink it. <laughs> um, it's like, uh, is to do like, I do like two or three ounces in a shot, and then I drink something right out, because I don't love fish, but it's so healthy. Um, and oh, actually my boss drinks a pint a day, which is totally insane. That is a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to give it a shot. I might yeah. tack it on to the end of this video just to prove to people. Yeah, I did it. It was well, and the turkey stock's good too, but I mean the fish stock, the deal with bone broth is like all bone broths are healthy, but there's nothing that comes close to the fish stock. So, cause you can imagine making a bone broth with a sole fish and having the entire fish minus the filet. So you have the eyes, the brain, yeah. the, the entire fish. And so there's just nothing that really comes close to that, but I'm a big advocate just in general. So uh, I'll give it a shot. So now people are, you know, starting to get on board with the whole idea of fermentation. It's really pretty exciting to see people asking about recipes and, and, and things like that. But what I find interesting is that, I mean, maybe it's because it's just so new. I mean, I'm doing this on a day, all day, every day, but um, I'm surprised that no one else is doing the fermentation. Mm -hmm. It's just you guys all of this time. Do you foresee a shift in the market? Uh, you know, I go back and forth on that. Um, because I know that there's interest, there's interest and there's not interest. Uh, I think it's kind of a scary thing for a lot of, uh, you know, mass producers or, or commercial producers of pet food. Um, because it's not just as simple as, you know, oh, well, let's just put some kombucha in meat and it'll, you know, uh, we are very lucky in that, you know, our head formulator has a degree, a master's degree in culturing dairy and in culturing just generally. And so that helps a lot, obviously. Um, but the thing about fermentation is, and you know this from doing those vegetables, it's not difficult, no. right? It's, it's, it's not a difficult thing to do. But I will say this, there is a... Um, there is something to scaling up that process. So it's not just you just take the recipe and increase it by 150 times and then you have, you know, you can, you can do that. Um, and so I think people are skeptical of that. It's kind of like if, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, we did the talk to us campaign on Pet Fooled. And so when you, when you talk about, when we talk about our bone broth, you know, Roxanne says that it's hot, it's easy to do in your kitchen, but it's hard to scale that up. And I think fermentation is the same way. But I also think that some of the stuff we use is completely foreign. I mean, kombucha, I mean, we grow our own kombucha in my boss's kitchen. 
that that actually you know ferments our beef and pork food and so if you're not familiar with that process you'd be like okay where do i start yeah. but so i go back and forth but i don't think so i've seen a little bit of fermentation in other products but you know most of most in the pet food industry i think a lot of people are going towards the freeze dried market mm -hmm. and that's something we're not going to do and i'll tell you right now uh, if you're going to, you know, freeze dry something, you may as well not even put fermented foods in it because you're defeating the purpose of said uh, mm -hmm. fermented foods. So um, uh, for us, there's always been an extreme amount of value in saying, um, you know, we don't cut any corners. And, and our, our, I always tell people it's because we don't have any salespeople. Our thing is like, look, we don't have a sales pitch. It's just the best thing, do it or don't. If you want to do it, great. If you don't, okay, we can't get everybody. And so I think that there's a lot of value in that. And I think that the fermentation sort of um, is a part of that. But I mean, you know, people have had the chance and they haven't done it yet. So yeah. who knows? So, you know, based on, you know, like what you can share, is there, are there any new products on the horizon? Because like 2017, we saw the cheeses and, mm -hmm. you know, the turkey stock. So what are you guys tackling next? Well, uh, the other thing too is we are currently um, opening our own plant. Oh. So, so that's happening right now. Um, and it's a huge thing uh, because we don't take on outside investors because we don't want to dilute the nutritional quality of the product. Mm -hmm. And so you, you got to think about this. It's a, literally a family in me, right? So it's, it's, you know, my two bosses are sisters. One of their husbands is the president. Their son is the CFO. Their niece does customer service. So it's literally just me and a family. Um, and so we're opening this plant, which is, you know, like a million dollars. It's crazy, you know. Um, and they're doing so much work on this plant that uh, Jacqueline, my boss, is buying a fold-out couch so she can sleep there. Uh, because it's an hour and a half from our corporate headquarters, which is our house up there. And there's just so much work to be done. So that's going to be a big deal, though, because... Once we do that, we will then make all of our own, you know, we'll make our own food, we'll freeze our own food, we'll store our own food. And that's very um, uh, unique for the pet food industry, for the raw pet food industry. Because yeah. a lot of, most companies, and us included for a long time, you know, somebody makes your food, then, some, then you send it somewhere to be frozen, then you have to send it somewhere else to be stored, then you have to send it to the distributors. Um, and I mean, we've always been unique in that way in that, you know, the raw pet food industry is much like other food industries in most cases where they're all made at one facility mm -hmm. and there's several facilities. So the whole time we've been made in a USDA facility that makes, we're the only pet food company there. And a lot of what we can do is based on, you know, our pre, pre before answer relationships with a lot of our Amish farmers um, and a lot of just local farmers in Pennsylvania. I mean, this was the same way. This is a very small meat producer um, in, you see their Hazel, I think it's called Hazel Park, but it's in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. So um, it's a very small producer. So we are opening our own plant, which is going to be really cool. Um, the other thing we're doing um, that's different, I think, than any other company is we're going to be doing a brick and mortar friendly online retail sales. Mm -hmm. oh, and, okay. Yeah. And so what we're going to be doing is, so we didn't want to say to, um, Sorry, something popped up on my computer. I don't know if you can see that. Hopefully not. Um, what we're going to do is we didn't want to say to our retailers that built us like, hey, thank you so much. Now we can sell online. Goodbye. You know, that would be because we want to take that ethic and, and be fair in, in our business relationships. And so um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a program where the stores can sell it two ways. Um, and that's essentially saying, um, they sell it at their store, but they can also say to their customers, hey, do you want this delivered to your door? Then just go to our website, click on the answers link. It'll go to our e-commerce, and then they'll actually get the commission off that sale. Nice. And now people will be able to order wherever they want. But the nice thing is a lot of people develop relationships with their independent retailers, mm -hmm. and um, they'll, they'll continue to do that, right? And the other cool thing is we have a lot of stores that work with you know, do nutrition consultations with people all around the country and they can still pick that one source. So, so we wanted to kind of include everyone. Uh, but I guess more importantly with the new products, uh